In a previous video, I covered using the built-in calibration tools in Orca Slicer in order to tune pressure advance and extrusion multiplier. Using those built-in calibration tools is an easy way for anyone to get started in tuning their printer, and I think that video is a good first step. I had a few requests to cover the rest of Orca Slicer's built-in calibration tools, and a commenter Carmel Zappa gave me G-code that gets the way I wanted to show you guys pressure advanced tuning from Andrew Ellis working. I'm Jacob with Butter Pockets, and let's get into it. Looking at Orca Slicer, they have temp, flow rate, and pressure advance, which are pretty standard tunings. Under more, they also have max flow rate and VFA, which stands for vertical fine artifacts. First, let's talk about max flow rate. I think this is a pretty self-explanatory test, but Stefan over at CNC Kitchen explains it in many of his videos and does a better job than I ever will. But essentially, your hot end can only melt plastic so fast. So if you keep printing faster and faster, your hot end has to melt plastic faster to keep up and extrude it. What this test does is it ramps up the speed until you can see the under extrusion because your hot end just can't keep up. Going to the calibration menu and selecting the max flow rate test, you can see that it starts at a volumetric speed of five millimeters cubed per second, which is volume over time, which is a rate, and volumetric speed is 20 millimeters cubed per second with a step of 0.5 millimeters cubed per second. If we hit okay, and we slice it, and we set the color scheme to speed, we'll see how this changes as each layer goes up. They also give you some convenient little marking tools that you'll see in the actual print, so you can tell when it's changing speeds. The thing is, Bamboo Labs kind of already tested all of this for you. And unless you swap to a new nozzle or do something drastic, I find that the limits set in the default filament profiles are pretty on par. But if you do want to run this test, you'll be able to figure out the max volumetric flow rate of your hot end. This can differ based on temperature and material that you're using. And a lot of materials can't even print at the max volumetric flow rate of your hot end anyway. When you run this test, you'll see that it starts at a very slow speed, that five uh, millimeters cubed per second flow rate and it'll ramp up as it goes up. I found that the default test using PLA at a 215 degrees Celsius temperature, all the way up the print, it looked fine and there was no signs of under extrusion, which means that PLA on my printer at 215C can print all the way up to 20 millimeters cubed per second volumetric flow rate, which is plenty fast. Because remember, as your volumetric flow rate goes up, your speed needs to go up too. And I find that I don't really need to print any faster than the stock profile. But if you wanna use the sport or ludicrous modes, this is where you might wanna bump up the volumetric flow rate. I'm interested to know y'all's results with this test, so let me know down in the comments. The next test is VFA or vertical fine artifact. This is a rather complicated topic and I'm gonna do my best to explain it. And I'm not gonna lie to you guys, I didn't know much about this topic when I was asked to cover it, which is ironic because at my day job, I design bulk acoustic wave filters as an electrical engineer, which means I deal with resonance every day. Most of what I'm gonna talk about is coming from Andrew Ellis, and I'll link his website down in the description, and ProRifi 3 d ProRifi3D.com, I'll link them as well. I have the model that Orca Slicer provides for VFA tuning, but I'm not quite sure what they were intending with this model. Um, they don't even have a write-up on their wiki, but one important thing is that VFA, vertical fine artifact, is kind of a misnomer. Essentially, these artifacts that you see in the z-axis are really just periodic ripples in your x and y axis that show up in the z. So before we go over this, I do want to try to explain what vertical fine artifacts are. Essentially, everything vibrates. When you hit something like your shelf or you plug a guitar string, it makes a sound. This happens because you put energy into the system and that energy has to go somewhere and it makes the system vibrate. And that vibration is in a frequency that the human ear can hear, so you hear a sound. All things vibrate at different frequencies, which is why when you hit it in different places or hit it with a different amount of energy, it is a different pitch or sound. But there will be a specific frequency called the resonance frequency. There's a lot of physics and math behind resonance, and I don't wanna cover that in this video. But the easiest explanation for these purposes is the frequency at which a given amplitude of energy into the system produces the biggest vibration. If you were to apply that same amount of energy at a different frequency, it wouldn't produce as much of a vibration. So how does all that relate to your printer? Well, the motors driving your different axes are turning at some given frequency relative to the speed that you are printing and this is causing your printer to vibrate. And in a core XY machine, each of these drives a different axis. If you pay attention to these motors, if you look when I move it forward, 
they both move. And if I move it sideways, they both move. But if I move it on a diagonal, only this one is moving. And if I move it on the other diagonal, only this one moves. So each of those motors is contributing in a different way when your tool head is moving in a different direction. And because of this, there will be some speed at which your printer vibrates at maximum intensity or resonates. And this will cause a visible pattern in your prints. A lot of people refer to this as ringing. The other interesting thing is this vibration will also impact the turning frequency of your motors. And it will do that at every speed. There will just be a speed that impacts it the most. ProRi5 3D, I hope I'm saying that right, has a really excellent write-up talking about all of this. And they even have a really good picture that shows that extrusion width changes as your motor turning frequency changes. I think the intention of this test was to test how when your tool head moves in these different directions, which motor is impacting it the most. But the thing is, it only tested each angle in one direction. So really you should print this and then rotate it. An easier way to do this would just be to print two cubes rotated at 45 degrees to each other, which is exactly what Ellis tells you to do in his write-up. Now, I don't know how useful that this test or any of these other VFA tests are, especially in a Bamboo Lab printer, because a lot of the tuning that you need to do to get this out of your print is done by either upgrading your motors to 0.9 degree stepper motors or tuning the way that your motors are driven. Hey guys, I'm editing right now, and I actually wanna interject right here that this is pretty much what Input Shaper is trying to solve. And I attached one of the graphs from my Voron of when I ran Input Shaper. And you can see the obvious spike where this thing is resonating at the frequency it's resonating and the power spectral density along with it. This is actually what your Bamboo Labs printer is doing when you run the self calibration or at the beginning of every print when it vibrates really quickly and it's sweeping modes. It's testing to see what speed of the tool head produces the biggest vibration and resonate. So this is one of the better ways to tune this and we know that the Bamboo Labs printers do this or should do this automatically. I at least wanted to show you guys how this test looks. This zero degree side is in line with the X axis this way. And all of these other numbers are in relation to this zero degree. The interesting thing is only on the right side. So here, 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 you can see a little bit of a, a pattern which I guess vertical fine artifacts where it's speeding up towards the top of the print. And then you can notice at the end of all of these where it's speeding up, um, there's a lot of gapping and under extrusion. I think this is more of a volumetric flow rate thing or a pressure advance thing rather than a vertical fine artifact. I can't exactly tell you why the pattern isn't on the other side of the print, moving the tool head in this 45 degree angle, why it's not on the other side when it went backwards through this. Really, you'd want to test the other motor as well. So you'd want to print this thing mirrored so that zero degrees was this way, and you would run 45 degrees this way, as well as these other angles. You may find a speed that produces the least amount of these artifacts, and you may find a speed that produces the most amount of these artifacts, but that's not really solving the problem. It's just helping you get around it by picking a speed that produces less vibration and doesn't make your printer resonate. Another really good way to help mitigate these issues is to put something heavy under your printer, like a stone paver, which is what I have under my Mark III, or a marble slab, which is what I have under my Mark IV. That's why people recommend this all the time, and those pavers can be found at your local hardware store for like less than $5. What this does is it lowers the resonance frequency of your printer by adding mass and decouples it from the surrounding environment. This should hopefully reduce what you see in the print due to the printer vibrating. The last thing is that the periodic nature of the teeth on the belts that drive your tool head well, these are about two millimeters apart, and it's actually going to cause a vibration in line with the spacing of these. And if you see artifacts in your prints that are about two millimeters apart, then it's probably your belts, and it can hopefully be solved by adjusting your belt tension. Ellis has a really good write-up on this specifically on his website. The last thing I want to cover is using Andrew Ellis's tool to run these pressure advanced calibration patterns. I previously showed you how to use Orca Slicer's built-in pressure advanced calibration, and this is a much better way to do it. It's easier to see, it's easier to remove, and it's way quicker.
This is where Carmel Zappa came in really clutch. He sent me some G-code that modifies the startup code that the X1 runs to get his tool working. Andrew Ellis' tool is, is going to be a website where you put in parameters for your printer and you export G-code and run that G-code directly on the printer. I'm going to show you guys how I set it up and I'm going to share that G-code that Carmel Zappa sent so that way you guys can run this on your X1. The beauty of Ellis' tool is how simple and obvious it is. What it's doing is it's sweeping through K values that you can set for pressure advance and then you can very obviously see how it's changing when you look at this 90 degree corner. I ran this wide sweep just to get a general feel of where the K value should be, and then I ran this precise sweep to really dial it in. So here I ran from 0 to 0 0.08. On this side where the K value is low, you can see a very obvious bulge here on the corner. And as it gets higher and higher, you will start to see where it separates. And when the K value gets really high, you can see that these lines are just completely separated. And I'll do some close up shots. But what we can see here is that from about 0.01, the bulging starts, goes away, and then around 0.02 is where, just above, it starts to separate. So between here and here is probably where my K value lies, which is why I ran this sweep, which just goes from 0.01 to 0.02. And if we look at these corners and try to find which one is sharpest, probably about here, about 0.019. I very much encourage you guys to go through Ellis's entire documentation on this, but going into his actual tool, I'm gonna show you the things that you need to change and go through these different settings so that way you can get it set up on an X1. The first thing here is the firmware. Set this to Marlin 1.1.9 plus. For your bed shape, it's rectangular, nozzle diameter 0.4 unless you have something else, filament diameter 1.75 unless you have something else, extrusion multiplier, you're going to want to put in whatever value that you found using the tuning method that I showed you in my previous video. Bed size for the X1 is 256 by 256, and these speeds and retract distances and other things come from the slicer and come from the printer itself. This is what is on my printer, it should be the same as yours, but you should definitely double check in the slicer just to be sure. So for travel speed, speed 500 millimeters per second, retract distance 0.8 millimeters, retract speed 30, unretract speed or detraction speed 30 millimeters per second, z-hop is enabled, z-hop height is 0.4 millimeters, I leave this anchor frame option how it is, first layer height is 0.2 or whatever that you want to run on your printer, first layer speed is 50 millimeters per second, again check your slicer, for these print settings uh, the speed and acceleration, again this comes from your slicer, for your print speed you should use your external perimeter speed, put in the cave values that you want to check between and the increment. Then you put in your bed temperature, your hot end temperature. I check, don't add G28 and don't add heating G code. And then this is where it gets tricky for the X1. This is where you need to paste the code that Carmel Zappa sent. You can check out what is different here between the G code that he sent me, which is actually based off of a much earlier version of the star G code. By pausing this section of the video, the G code that Carmel Zappa sent me is on the left and the G code from the most updated version of Orca Slicer is on the right. It's gonna spit out what the actual start G code is. Like he recommends, you should check over it, but I ran this on my printer and it works. And if you have an X1, it should work for you too. Take all that with a grain of salt. It is your printer and I'm not responsible for that. The end G code is also just gonna come from the slicer. Go to the machine G code section here in your printer settings and copy this end G code. And then once you have all that pasted and everything is correct, double check everything. Give it a name, download the G-code. You're then gonna take this G-code and put it on a micro SD card and put it in your printer. And once you do that, you're gonna be able to select it on the screen and you're gonna be able to run it. One thing I definitely recommend keeping the bed in the middle or towards the top of the printer because if you run this G-code, and your bed is at the bottom, which this G-code will put your bed at the bottom, the first thing it will do is try to move the bed down and it will start skipping your Z-axis motors. This is fine. It's not actually gonna damage your printers, but most people probably don't want their printers skipping and making a lot of noise when you start this print. So I just recommend to keep the bed in the middle and move it after you finish this, especially for when you run the second pass. 
All right, and there you have it. You should have a better understanding of max volumetric flow rate, vertical fine artifacts, and a better way to tune pressure advance on your Bamboo Labs printer. Let me know in the comments if you run any of these and how they work out for you. And not to show for subscribers any more than I normally do, but I'm about halfway to becoming a YouTube partner. And that would be great because what that means is I can make even more videos for you guys. So please subscribe if you like the content. And it may or may not make your prints buttery smooth. I'll see you guys in the next one.